when it's Thursday morning and after two and a half months of me working on my tempo and endurance at tempo, Coach Lavarak is back on the deck and he's back on the deck with a big bang to work on my threshold and ability to surge. We've got 50, 50 seconds, sorry, not 50 minutes, at 305 watts, so I have five to 10 watts above my FTP, followed by 20 minutes at FTP. I put it at an aspirational 300 watts, but every 50 seconds, we do a 10 second surge at 350 watts. I about 125% of FTP, here we go. We put the air conditioning on. Trying to find my equilibrium early on. A little bit below the power range here. Trying to arrive with precision. This is very much power zone six. getting used to the transition, trying to figure out the gearing. Tom Danielson's 11 power zones have proven to be controversial, and that's no bad thing. As I mentioned when I introduced his methods in my video, 12 minute test to improve control of power, there's something about the 11 power zones and the implications for the different energy systems being used for each that resonates with my own experience. I have no doubt that the concept of using our FTP from our 20 minute test works really well for setting training zones. And that's how the zones have been set here for this workout. And it works really well because a typical training is very specific about the power zones being targeted and the transition from one power zone to the next. Berg mode. It's not engaged. We'd the 10 seconds for each user. And additionally, a training is typically one to two hours in duration rather than four hours or more. However, for me personally, targeting the longer sportives and events outside, for example, 100 to 180 kilometers, with plenty of climbing thrown in to boot, I think that the 11 power zones is really helpful. And this is because I have a tendency to consider my FTP as derived from my 20 minute test as being a measure of what should be achievable on a long climb. And in Italy, this is exactly where I came a little bit unstuck on the first couple of days, because using FTP as the gold standard by which I measure my capacity over 45 minutes to an hour to deliver that kind of power is probably a little bit too unrefined and usually too ambitious. But riding 15 watts lower, well, that was just about right. Sure, on an amazing diamond legs day, yeah, I've got close to sustaining my FTP power for an hour, but diamond legs days aren't the norm. During my recent one hour FTP test outdoors, once again I found that I was about 15 watts below my then FTP of 297, hitting 282 watts for the hour of power. I also find that time spent above FTP on the longer ride, certainly for me, does disproportionate damage to my endurance and overall pace. This all accords in my own experience that there are different flavors of threshold, and depending on which flavor you're using, I do believe there are different implications for which energy systems are predominantly being used to sustain the desired power.
I also love the concept of targeting a power zone and trying to ride accurately within a floor and a ceiling within that zone and also being mindful of the predominant energy sources in play. Also, the three levels of threshold power under Tom's 11 zones accords in my own experience of actually deploying the power on the road, with power zone 5 lower threshold giving 60 to 75 minutes of runway, whereas power zone 6, i threshold, gives me about 20 minutes, and power zone 7, 10 to 12 minutes, i high threshold. And I love power zone 5 because it's a bit more precise and less abstract to me than Sweet Spot and also seems to provide a very big bang for your energy buck. The cadence has dropped too low. I also fully agree that everybody is different, including in respect to their ability to utilise body fat for energy. But in my own experience, including my recent sportive training ride where I was fasted and the ride was over four and a half hours covering 105 kilometres and 2,000 metres of climbing in central London, as featured on my last training vlog, well this seemed to confirm to me that these concepts fit well with my own physiology. That's better. It is to bring the cadence up. So during that ride, for the two hours of hill repeats within it, I was disciplined about staying within the power zone 5 floor and ceiling, i.e. 260 to 290 watts. And the same for the subsequent hour at upper endurance in power zone 4, i.e. 225 to 240 watts. So therefore I was able to sustain four and a half hours of riding, consuming only water and amino acids before and during the ride, and that in turn led me to conclude that fat must have been used as a primary source of energy throughout and that valuable muscle glycogen was being spared. Depending on your ability to use fat for energy, this of course could yield varying degrees of success, but I still think there is a concept of relativity. So even if you are as an individual more prone to utilizing carbs and glycogen as your source of energy, I think that being more mindful about your deployment of power and the power zones you're using and the intensity you're using could still help reduce the rate of glycogen depletion if you use those power zones strategically. So I'm going to continue to experiment with and explore Tom's concepts, which as I touched on are much more holistic than simply 11 power zones. It's all about the accuracy of power in the targeted zone and making strategic decisions as when to add in intensity, but accept that you're going to deplete your muscle glycogen faster, but when to dial it back and go more into the endurance zones and hopefully use a little bit more body fat and spare the glycogen. But it's also about body position on the bike, pedaling technique, cadence, plus nutrition and mindset. I've also decided to make a small adjustment in order to refine my own 11 power zone grid by basing my zones around the 317 watts average power I achieved for Tom's 12 minute tests. Yes, I was pretty consistent throughout, but it was a little bit of a ramp. And Tom is clear that it's actually a little bit better to ride within yourself. Therefore, rather than going off the final four minutes of that test, 325 watts, I'm going off the 317. And that in turn results in a power zone six 
of 301 watts, which is currently much more realistic for me personally based on what I'm doing in Zwift races and recent tests outdoors than the 309 watts derived from the test in the final four minutes. And the same applies to the upper threshold where obviously I get a power zone seven of 317 watts rather than the 325. I didn't realise we went straight into 230. I wouldn't have burnt myself out on that last 50 seconds if I'd known that. Or if I'd seen it. I'm going to report back on my success, or indeed not, as to implementing these methods during the Struggle Dales this coming weekend. It's 174 kilometres, 2,875 metres of elevation with seven punchy climbs with sticky, undulating Yorkshire roads. I'm going to be targeting power zone 5 on the climbs and power zone 3 to 4 on the flat stroke low incline. It's definitely going to be my biggest challenge to date. We're settling in now to the task in hand. I report back. I'm just coming up to 20 minutes of the tempo. It feels good. I do love training at tempo. Very rhythmic. You go and get a nice pace. And for me, it's quite uplifting. I've been in the kind of power zone four, 210 to 240 watt range. I'm feeling good, but I'm gonna have to cut this interval a few minutes short in order to wrap up the training session and do the big commute upstairs to get on some work course. I'll report back in just a second. And please do remember to give the channel some LCS love. Like, comment, and subscribe. So on the screen, we have Zwift's power profile. And I reckon I definitely stay in the power range throughout. Definitely power zone five throughout. Um, the 50 second effort. I didn't let myself dip at any stage below 260. Oh, actually maybe a tiny little moment in the green there. Um, but generally I reckon was in the 290 to 310 range um, for those 50 second efforts. I was falling a little bit below on some of the surges. I was kind of dropping down into the 320 range uh, for some of them. I found it very, very demanding this and then obviously quickly picked up into the tempo, which I did for just 20 minutes there. We'll have a quick look at training peaks. So taking a quick squeeze here at the training peaks data, the 20 minute power, 305 watts, and I guess the 21 minute power would be about the same. And then looking at the efforts themselves, I've checked out, I've been pretty much in the power range throughout, about, around about 290 to 300 watts for the 50 seconds and 3.30 to 3.60 um, for the um, 10 second sprints. Sort of, so you can see here, just a little bit below the 3.05 I was targeting for the first 50 seconds, but then um, getting nicely into the pickle barrel um, for the various different intervals. I had a couple um, you know, during the test where for the 50 seconds I was down in the high 280s, 288, 287, I think they come along very shortly. Um, but I had a stern conversation with myself mentally. It does require a fair bit of mental fortitude and got back um, into the power range, um, especially when you get towards the final four or so intervals, you're encouraged and it's almost like you're racing for the line. And um, obviously finished with a nice little flourish, 333 watts for the final uh, 50 seconds, like I was draining the tank. And thus ends an incredible but disgusting training courtesy of Coach Laverack, he of the minute waistline but gargantuan FTP. It was a superb training obviously to build threshold power but also mental fortitude and great for racing too. I mean, having to surge into VO2 max and then recover at threshold is super challenging but doable over that kind of time frame. so highly recommended. And if you like the video, please do remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed, I'd be very grateful if you would. It's now time for me to make the big old commute upstairs to crack on with work and have a little bit of post-ride nutrition and recovery, charge up the batteries ahead of some activities over the weekend. Now over the last couple of weeks, I've been bringing the body weight dip back into my program after the heavier sets on the incline bench and the chin up. That's because the dip is also 
Another very good compound movement, working multiple muscle groups at the same time. The triceps, the pecs, a little bit of shoulders, and also the core. If you lack flexibility through the upper torso and struggle to get the range of motion, maybe work on that first before really going hard on the dip. I really love it after the sort of the heavier sets because you can just use your body weight and therefore it's good for building a bit of strength but also muscle size through uh, the tricep and that's quite helpful when you're up and out the saddle on the bike. Here we go. Feels really good there. You're squeezing the bicep a little bit on the way down and squeezing the tricep uh, to initiate the extension upwards. Obviously looking for a nice deep range of motion, well below parallel. And that's where the flexibility in the upper torso is needed. And then squeeze the tricep hard again at the top of the movement. Like I say, an amazing compound movement here. Well, as ever, it's my personal belief that if you work the front of the torso, you should also work the rear. So today, complementing the dip with a rowing movement. Here, using an underhand grip, i.e. the palms under the bar. That means I initiate the movement by squeezing the lats hard, and the bicep is also involved in the upward phase of the movement. We squeeze the lats hard at the top for a count of one, and then slowly lower for the eccentric part of the movement to a full range of motion before repeating. Now with a bent over row, it's critical to have good back health, i.e. a nice straight back. Now if you're hinging at the hips, trying to keep the chest up and the back locked out throughout the movement. Therefore, good core stability is integral. Another great compound movement for building strength, but also flexibility and stability on the bike. It's quite some time since I've done the race and you're having to sustain that position requires quite a lot of energy. Not a bad thing for also burning a few calories. <sighs> Hope and ease are gonna help with the deadlifting too because clearly there's a lot of lat and core involvement in those movements as well. And here's a nice looking tea, courtesy of Jane. The tuna's gonna deliver plenty of protein and amino acids to repair the muscles that were damaged in the gym, hopefully a little bit stronger and more powerful than before the day began. Vegetable stir fry and rice. Rice to fuel tomorrow's race. Hoping for a good one.